Let's go. go. Well, welcome. My name is Kate Harmon. I'm the Director of Cross-Campus Engagement for the Lundquist Center for Entrepreneurship. And today on our Getting Ahead series, I'm excited to have with us Peter Ozelin, who is the principal of Achieve One, a consulting agency based in Bend, where Peter mentors other startup founders based on his decades record as a serial entrepreneur. So welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, I, we'll start off talking a little bit about your college career. Um, you are an OUO graduate with degrees in economics and political science. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your college career was like at UO. Um, what did you have planned as a future career at that time? And um, you know, what kind of activities and things were you involved in as a, as a UO student? Yeah, so it's probably encouraging uh, for most of your students to hear that I, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, uh, when I went to college, I mean, actually I had some uh, preconceived sort of notions that I would be studying medicine because my my father is a, is an orthopedic and uh, uh, so there were some uh, suggestions about that, but I, I pretty, pretty much quickly learned that probably wasn't going to be my path and uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I started falling into the, I would say the more of the business track and uh, I enjoyed economics because I felt like it was sort of, um, as I got a little bit further into it, it was a little bit like puzzles and logical reasoning. Um, versus uh, some of the other things that, uh, you know, that I, I could consider. And then, uh, and then I ended up with poli sci because I just enjoyed the class, uh, the classes and I thought they were engaging in the way that uh, some of the teachers there were able to present the material. And, and I found myself my senior year, I, I, in fact, most electives I was taking were three or 400 classes. And, and then I was about to graduate and I was like, well, it looks like I have pretty much have a double major. So I almost did it in the inverse. And then I took the 100 or 200 level classes my last couple of quarters to finish up with, uh, with a uh, degree, with, with, uh, with a dual major. So that was sort of inverted in some, some respects. Um, yeah. And then I think as far as, uh, you know, what I was involved in at the uh, university was uh, probably not too uh, indifferent from what a lot of kids there do. I had some leadership roles in different uh, communities I was involved in, but uh, really tried to just enjoy the overall co uh, college experience. And while I had to work some throughout, like probably a lot on this call or they're observing this, um, I was fortunate to have in-state tuition and things like that that uh, made it a little bit more manageable. Great, great. Uh, well, you went on then after you graduated from UO to uh, earn your MBA and JD degrees at Willamette uh, University up the road, uh, where you actually also started your very first company, Legal Anywhere. Um, talk us to, uh, a little bit about you know how the idea for Legal Anywhere came up and what was it like to start a company while you were in this intensive uh, graduate programs at the same time? Yeah, yeah. So you know, as you can kind of imagine, it's probably not the, I would say, the normal um, approach to, you know, kind of getting through grad school. Uh, and, and one other element to that, too, is I, I actually, after my second year, after my first year of law school, I started clerking. Actually, it was after my second year, I started clerking for a law firm. I had done an intern before with Frank Russell Company. So, I mean, some of this, I was kind of also trying to balance working as well. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was probably, I mean, if I have to really think back on it, probably one of obviously the more challenging times of my life, because uh, here I am with an idea I want to pursue. I'm in grad school. I'm pretty committed to finishing that. You know, I'm two years through the process at this point. I've done one year of law school, I've done one year of the MBA program, and that's sort of when I had this idea about legal anywhere, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, it, you know, it's sort of the, like the switch I couldn't turn off. I mean, just because I was in school, um, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't able to sort of uh, defer this interest, you know. And it was really, it was really in weird and interesting. It was a bit, a bit like a calling. And now that having been said. I was probably not a very typical student in the from the start anyways like so for example I didn't really get into the competitive dynamic of 
you know, having to get straight A's through law school, let's say, I mean, I, I, and I, and I, maybe this isn't what your parents want to hear if you're, they're going to send you to, to law school or they're going to help support that or your MBA programs or whatever. But I kind of selectively chose to work really hard in certain classes and in those classes, I would end up usually with good grades and other ones, honestly, I just sort of said, okay, I'm probably not going to pursue this type of law. So let's just get, by and uh you have to make sort of those choices especially when you know when we were um you know when i was investing and undertaking the company and i guess when it's all sort of said and done on that um i had it is sort of the time in my life when things came together where it's like okay this is what you're supposed to be doing and prior to that actually you know i was interested in law but even going to law school i didn't really see myself as doing that forever i sort of had this plan of my life i might practice law for four to five years and I was eventually going to go start, you know, probably do my own thing anyway. And, and, um, it just happened sooner than I expected. And, and I think that's, you know, part of life, right? You don't, you don't always get to choose your path. Sometimes it chooses you a little bit if you, if you're responsive to it. And so legal anywhere was a combination of a lot of things going on in the world and inflection points and the world wide web was really sort of at its infancy. And, you know, students are given access to, you know, um, uh, we were given access to the internet almost before the, uh, you know, I would say the public had really sort of started using it from a, a business standpoint or commercial standpoint. And so it, it just became something where I could see what was going to happen. And so, uh, you know, initially we focused on building websites for law firms, but the real drive where Legal Anywhere was sort of collaborative, secure environments for law firms to work with their clients. And I guess the motivation at that time was I was a pretty young, I mean, I was going to be a young lawyer coming out and in, into the, the legal profession and um, there, how was I going to differentiate myself? So I sort of looked at it like, would I use this to differentiate myself in terms of higher level of service and things of that nature? And that way I could be more competitive with people that maybe had been practicing longer. And so it seemed to me that that would resonate with, other lawyers, young or old, frankly, I mean, if they could have a better um, synergy with their clients. So, so yeah, that then that was underway. And, you know, all of a sudden, I'm two years later, I'm graduating and, and I've got a, an offer to work in a law firm after the JD MBA program. And on the other hand, I've got Legal Anywhere, which has, I'm not making any money, but I have like maybe 10 beta clients and um, you, I, you know, the choice I made is probably obviously at this point and, and, you know, the next thing I know, five years later, that, that company is doing well and has a, you know, has a good outcome. And so that sort of set me down that path. That's great. That's great. Well, what was really fascinating, I think, to me to hear was while you were uh, fundraising for Legal Anywhere, um, you had this, you know, innate self-awareness to bring on uh, a more experienced CEO uh, to your team after you had originally raised your own initial friends and family round. So um, can you share with us a little bit about what, um, how you knew what you didn't know um, uh, to build the right team that you needed for legal anywhere to be successful? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's also sort of the temperament I look for in entrepreneurs in general, like when I'm working with them uh, from an advising standpoint or just some of the the knowledge I want to pass on because I think the, the, the commitment you have to what you want to achieve, if you are starting a, a business with your, you know, by yourself or with uh, colleagues or whatever is to have that business be successful. And that, and that's sort of the first commitment over, I think everything else, if you're raising money or you're getting people to contribute. And so um, as long as you stay focused on that and you're, and, then then I'm not inclined to sort of let my ego get too involved and in, am I the right person to do this and put it through to the end? I mean, I was, you know, I was 25 or whatever, and uh, I don't come from a business background and family. And, and it just, uh, it felt like I needed that a little bit more maturity. And then some of it was just sort of the, the reality of the marketplace. You know, I was out there making progress, but then, you know, fundraising is a, is a, is a tricky endeavor and um, there's certain, you know, dominoes you need to fall in place. And, and I wasn't very familiar with how all that worked. Now there are lots of tools available these days and there's pitch, you know, uh, practices you can go through. So 
you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of say, interpret what I'm saying is it can't be done. It can be done. And there's plenty of stories of that. I just think of, of really, you know, young people do having great results and, and that's fantastic. And, uh, but again, for me, it was, um, the commitment to success was first thing. And I found, a you know, a great CEO that became a mentor and then brought in other investors that became sort of investors in, uh, subsequent companies where I was the leader and I had, or the, or the, the CEO, I still considered myself a leader at that time, but I ran a different function for legal anywhere after we brought in the CEO and, uh, and, uh, saw, saw a good result. And, and, and we wouldn't have had that happen if, if I hadn't done that. Um, and in fact, there's a little bit of a different thread, another one other thread to it. It was, I mean, it was sort of the moment of truth because I had a co-founder that was, you know, older than me and had practiced law for like 13 years. And, and, you know, I had to, in some respects, sort of tell him that, look, if we don't do this, this, we're not going forward. And, you know, 26, 27, whatever it was at that point, um, again, a defining moment, but you know, when you have an idea, you're sort of the keeper of that idea and you, your intuition will tell you a lot. And, and, and in my experience, that is more than experience. It's, it's the thing that actually, actually helps you make the best decisions regardless of your age. Well, Legal Anywhere, Anywhere was um, the first of your companies built specifically for a very niche targeted market. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, why niche markets are attractive areas for you um, over the course of your career to explore. Um, and, and how do you go about sort of identifying those markets to spend your time or money in? Yeah, great question. And, you know, this is, um, you know, it sort of goes back to, you know, your temperament, your you know, degree of risk you want to take as an entrepreneur. I mean, if you're starting something like Instagram or you got an idea for that or a big social network, uh, generally speaking, I mean, what you're going to need to make that successful is uh, a lot of money and, and, and you're going to be competing in sort of uh, a marketplace where you likely have a lot more competitors. So uh, niche markets became, uh, to me, were attractive because I could, I mean, I could see trends happening outside of the, the, the niche market, let's say, that could be applicable to my niche that was being underserved. And so the legal profession, what I learned is that uh, uh, they can be sort of laggards when it comes to technology and things of that nature. Um, and so, and it doesn't mean they won't adopt, it means that they're just not the first as, as it might be like corporate America that's cutting edge. And there's always, there's always sort of visionaries within any segment that you approach. And so it became a matter of finding those and, and I felt the risk profile was, while risky, it wasn't as risky as trying to, you know, bet the farm on, uh, on a bigger market. And either way, you know, it requires a lot of work. And I think the, if you're gonna, for me, if I was going to spend all that time in my life doing something, I wanted to um, mitigate the chances of <laughs> failure a little bit by approaching these niche markets and, and sort of then results ends up being, at least in my experience, is you know you build this intimacy with the market, and um, and then when the big competitors do come around looking for sort of more market share, um, they don't understand or they don't sort of have those relationships and uh, uh, to, to address sort of those idiosyncrasies. So we were able to sort of keep much larger companies at bay, and it was really, I, I felt like that was a pattern that was repeatable. And so in my time right now, um, part of what the chief one is I've sort of moved on from Manzam and we'll talk about that company in a minute, but um, he's really trying to find entrepreneurs that have sort of, you know, have recognized these underserved niches and maybe they have some domain experience there, some passion. And so that becomes uh, what I think is, uh, is, uh, is, you know, kind of fun to do from, from my perspective. Yeah, that's great, great insight. Um, well, Legal Anywhere was acquired in 2001, and then you spent your next several years um, in various C-suite level uh, positions at uh, legal focused technology companies where you were overseeing products and services. Um, share with us a little bit about this span of your career. Uh, what did you oversee, and uh, what were some of the things that you learned uh, kind of in this more corporate role? Yeah. So. Um the 
you know, the, I, I think the value of, well, in some ways I was very fortunate because legal anywhere did work out. And, and through that, I, you know, was able to, uh, you know, achieve a lot of different relationships across sort of this legal market, which if you don't understand the legal market. I mean, it's actually a really big market. I mean, some of the large law firms in the world do several billions of dollars in revenue a year and they have offices all over the world and, and they're serviced by very large companies like Thompson Reuters and LexisNexis. So it's, it's a, it's a really pretty amazing career path. And what I felt like I wanted to do at that time, because I didn't have, you know, another idea for a startup and incidentally was hired by one of the, my clients of my legal anywhere startup, which was one of the largest law firms in the world, Paul Hastings, Janowski Walker out of LA as their chief knowledge and chief technology officer was that, you know, I kind of wanted to see the inner workings. I wanted to see it from the other side of the equation of the market that I'd actually been selling to. And, and so for me, it was about learning. I mean, I probably didn't, well, I mean, not probably, I didn't see myself there uh, indefinitely. It was a, a kind of a stepping stone. And, and I was, again, I felt like I was very fortunate because I sort of got to bypass trying to climb a corporate ladder there, if you will. And uh, was able to sort of work directly with the partners at these uh, at, at the firm I was at, and and it gave me a lot more management experience as well because my teams were a lot bigger than what I built from sort of inception, and and because I, all I'd ever known was sort of a startup, I, I needed a relative experience, right? And so after doing that for some time, and then also going to Thomson Reuters uh, uh, as vice president there. And there's a, a few other things. I was still pretty active in the entrepreneurial community. I was investing and doing some things on boards. I mean, but it really sort of gave me that contrast to where what I needed to be doing is what I ended up doing in my you know last business is, is the early stage stuff. And, you know, one of my kind of things I always remind myself, I tell people of is no se te ipsum, you know, the Latin phrase for know thyself. And if, if you really know what you're, good at and your capabilities, then I think it's, you know, your, your path to, to, to the end game is much easier. And that was just what I needed to do. And so, uh, but, I'm, but again, I, being a learner, it was always a place to learn and uh, use that knowledge, which became really relevant when I went back and I had a, another company that I started now that is sold and, you know, 10 years later. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, let's talk, talk about your second company, um, Manzamba, uh, which you started in 2010. Um, discuss how Manzamba came about. Um, where did you get the idea for it, and and how did that? Uh, how did you get that company off the ground? Yeah. So this, is, I mean, this is the thing about. Uh, I think, you know, for your uh, students that are really. Uh, don't know that what they want to do, but they're maybe sort of investigating what might be possible from an entrepreneurial perspective is, um, is, is sort of that continued awareness of an idea may sort of present itself. And so I, uh, I've been, you know, after moving to Bend, we had moved from Santa Monica after I finished my uh, route at uh, Thompson Reuters. And, you know, this is where we wanted to, you know, raise a family and do that sort of thing. So I was consulting, I was a bit bouncing around, but I ended up well, with a few other um, like-minded colleagues, we started something in Ben called the Idea Club. And, and the, I, I mean, the notion of it was that for about the 10 people or so we had involved in this, um, every month someone would come and they would be on the hook to, to pitch an idea to this group. And it, we didn't make it really heavy lifting, it'd be like a one pager and a little executive summary and you'd say, hey, I think this could be, and then the group would serve as a sounding board to say, well, do this, don't do that. Are you sure the market looks like that? And what are you gonna do there? You know, are, these, you know, are there other competitors and this kind of thing? And so I found myself, I was two weeks away from it was my turn to pitch. I was up for to pitch an idea. And I'm like, I don't really, I don't have any ideas. And then I saw, so I said, I gotta start. And then I gotta start thinking about this and make sure I'm sort of paying attention to what's out there. And so, maybe a few days later i got a, an email from my sister-in-law and she was in the hotel industry and, and she said hey i thought you might be interested in this this is a company that's 
doing something what were at the time called listening platforms or social media monitoring platforms for the hotel industry. And so I went and I started looking at that and I was like, oh, well, this has some applicability to the legal industry. Again, the whole sort of notion of a laggard market already happening in the uh, elsewhere in the corporate space, not yet identified as a need in the, in the legal space. And so long and the short, I take this back to the group, not knowing if I'm going to do it. And I, I pitch it and they start kind of, you know, uh, hammering with the questions. And by the end of the meeting, they're like, well, why this, you got to do this. So, and then I was like, oh, okay, great. I guess I'm, I'm on my way. And so, um, I had my co-founder was also a part of that idea club and it's, it's amazing, you know, what frameworks like that can do. And so, uh, the rest, as they say, is sort of history. Well, when did you, did you have any, um, as founder and CEO of Mazamba, you know, did you have an early aha moment, if you will, um, when you knew Manzama was going to be really big? Yeah, that's, uh, let me think about that. I, I will say one thing, just sort of from a contextual standpoint, and I know that this is a hard time in the economy and we're having this during, you know, a, sort of, a, you know, in the middle of a recession and 2010 wasn't that far off, right? 2009 was the bottom of the last recession that we had. And looking back on it, I, it wasn't trying to time this as I was trying to start something in a recession, but you know, I saw a statistic like five years later after we came out of the recession, uh, where if you were to start a company five years later, you would have uh, three times as many competitors because financing became better and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of evidence to say when markets are down is the time to do stuff, you know, because it's hard. And so I felt in some ways I benefited from that, but in terms of, you know, the aha moment, um, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was one thing, but it seemed to be that um, I sort of refer to this sometimes with, uh, you know, with my team members when we were pursuing, you know, different initiatives that come in. It seemed like the path was opening up without a lot of effort. I mean, I was still working hard, but the, the pieces were falling into place. I didn't. And so you know, if you're working 12, 15 hours, let's say a day, and the pieces aren't falling in place, it feels like you're pushing a, a rock uphill. But I continue to have little successes that sort of all of a sudden created that uh, sort of significant aha uh, reaction. And, and then I think once we had our first financing, kind of significant financing without a lot of clients per se, but we had beta clients and they're about to turn into paying clients. To me, that was like, okay, that was that was probably the easiest this has ever happened for me. And it's not just because I've been an entrepreneur before. It was because I, I you know, it looked like it was going to uh, be the kind of thing that could be successful. That's great. That's great. Well, I know Manzambo was acquired just earlier this, this year. Um, as you look back over that, that 10 year span, um, you know, what were maybe some of the bigger challenges as CEO um, that you had to manage um, with the growth of, of Manzama? Yeah, so um, I think the probably one of the misconceptions about starting a company is like it, you, you're, uh, well, the first thing is you have to be a risk taker. I mean, that sort of states the obvious. But the reality is, I mean, you're, you're interpreting and taking risks the whole way through. And so you don't stop being a risk taker. Um, and it becomes sort of a spectrum of risk that you end up um, you know, that just becomes part of your uh, life and the way that you operate. And I think that that's a really big challenge because you, your first mission is pretty clear and you start to grow and you get acquired like we did. We started to acquire customers, but then all of a sudden it becomes, you know, in our case, you know, we were focused on the uh, legal industry, as you, as you know, and, and in, in that niche, it became, oh, we started getting clients outside of that. How much resources do we put into going after consultants or financial services? And what about you know, smaller law firms versus big law firms. What about internationally? What about, and so I felt like uh, there's a lot of people giving opinions at that point. You have investors, you have board members, and um, you know, those are critical decisions that, you know, could, you know, determine your success or lack thereof. And so I felt like that was the hardest part and continuing to sort of be in, in tune with your intuition um, and making the right judgments. In fact, probably the hardest one was when I was about 
at this point we were about six years in and we had, you know, become through a lot of hard work, you know, kind of the market leader in, in our sort of uh, segment of products and, and we were growing fine. In fact, we were really the most profitable that year that we had been. And, um, you know, we were, uh, people were making more, we were paying our employees, we had a lot of nice benefits, new offices, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, what's, if I were going to disrupt myself as a company, what would that look like? Who would disrupt us? Who would come in and, 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 you know, take us off our path or maybe even make us obsolete. And, and again, looking outside the industry, some, I mean, I could see that, oh gosh, this is going to be a wave of like artificial intelligence and, you know, more data science, you know, going deeper into what we do is finding insights in the news. And, and honestly, it was sort of uncomfortable because I had to kind of reinvent the business in some ways. I mean, the base business was doing fine, but I, you know, basically between myself and the co-founder and four and whatnot, you know, I, we went there and I said, look, we got to take 35% of our resources this year and hire another, you know, a totally different development team to build these AI products and re-engage the market and begin to, and it became a product called Mazama Insights because that's what's coming and we need to be seen as innovator. And there was a lot of uncertainties with that, whether that would work. And I felt like it was a startup, not quite within a startup because we were maybe at this point early stage. But it was it was uh, pretty difficult to do again, and um, that. But the good news is at that point, you know, we had a great client base that was loyal and that served as my advisory board. And I was able to bring these ideas to them, and 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 frankly, it was the decision that enabled our company to kind of get back in a faster growth rate. And and if you look at the building blocks, that's that was probably the last significant one was uh, that led to our acquisition as a as a higher growth company and a better return for our investors so you know i think that's the thing you got to kind of contemplate like if you start something and you build it and you you know you've sold it within five years you probably realize your maximum you know you realize that trajectory but what if you're longer you know what if you become a real i mean when i say a real business you might be around for 15 20 i mean then it's not as you know then you have to uh kind of make those types of decisions so a bit of a long-winded answer but um, yeah, that's, that's how great. it sort of played out. No, that's really informative. Um, well, I know from a, an earlier conversation with you, um, one of the, the things I learned about you is that you have these three personal rules that you live by uh, that helps inform you whether you will act on an entrepreneurial idea. Um, can you share with us what those three rules are and, and how did you arrive at them? Yeah, let's make sure I get that 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 the same thing right here because uh, I know you just sent me that question. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, let's see. Personal. Oh, here we go. Um, okay. So yeah, these are the things like I, they're almost like principles for me. And again, when I work with uh, entrepreneurs and what I try to help them identify and encourage them to do is, um, you know, have a lot of um, confidence in their ability to be able to be successful because it doesn't take, you know, um, someone with a certain pedigree. I mean, it's, it's, it's really comes down to um, your perspective, right. Of, about yourself and about learning and all these sort of things. And so it's really, it's really fun to try to help, you know, facilitate that. And so one of my rules I just sort of developed over time with customers and building products uh, because, you know, your windows succeed is so tight and you don't have a lot of resources, let's say, you know, endless supply of resources was, you know, don't let someone's inaction become your detriment. And so a lot of times it's applied to like product development and customer interactions. Like if, you know, uh, if they're not telling you, which they don't often why your thing doesn't work, you know, um, you know, that, that could lead to a problem. So even if you ask them and they don't get back to you, so you have to find ways to really facilitate a customer success. So for us, when we were early on, say with products and this applied to legal anywhere as well as Manzam and other business I've been involved in, you know, your products, it wasn't perfect by any means. You're sort of discovering what the market needed and things of that nature. So, uh, we were always investing a lot of uh, sort of 
complementary services to make them successful, even if it meant that we had to do all the work to sort of get this to a place where they would actually benefit from the from the data that Manzama was providing. And over time, it became you know a little bit more self serve. So um, that was a big one. I, I think also I I kind of always had this sort of thing in the back of my mind if I came across some, something that was possible, I I would just say, well, why not me? I mean, it's very why does it have to be someone else? Why, why, I'm going to pick up the paper and read about someone else building a successful product that I had an idea about. And, and I just didn't, I didn't like that feeling. And I just wanted to at least feel like I, I could take that shot of it, um, at doing something like this. And then I think my last rule was the, the notion of time and how I wanted to spend my time. Um, uh, I, I, I guess, the easiest way to describe this, I had a really low tolerance for wasted time. And, and that's probably why I wasn't a very good fit in the corporate world. And, and frankly, in some respects, that's not always a fair statement to the corporate world because the processes involve, they just take more time and um, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's the path anybody on this, that, that this, you know, the views this goes down, good for them. And like I said, there's a lot of learnings there. Uh, but I didn't have a lot of patience to <laughs> sort of live through a lot of the, the, the time in which that took. And, um, and it was a very, there was, it was a very defining moment. I mean, I can remember when I was like 24 coming back from an internship and a good internship I mentioned I had with Frank Russell company. And, and it's just part of the way you got to work through those bigger organizations. But I just, I was not even working there two, three months. So I'm like, I just, I can't, I can't waste my time. I'd rather do something else so that was always a big balance for me and it is today too uh because um it's the one i mean it's a finite resource <laughs> yeah well and i think a lot of um entrepreneurs identify with that one last one particularly because of that lack of of patience of of you know being in an environment where things are so slow to change yeah. um, so uh, i think that really resonates with a lot of us um, uh, talk to us a little bit. I know from our an earlier conversation, uh, we talked a little bit about fundraising and um, I thought it was really interesting. One of the things that you had talked about was how, um, you know, founders should be cautious of investors who want to have an active role in their company. Um, can you expand a little bit about why, why that's um, something that founders might want to think about as they, start to evaluate what investors uh, to get involved in? Yeah, that's a great, another great question. I, I mean, so I, I think one thing to remember is, I'm, and I remember, you know, when, when I was doing my first startup, like I said, with Legal Anywhere, kind of 24, 25, in this, in the, especially in the technology space, it might be different elsewhere, but, you know, there's a lot of venture capital and things of that nature. And, um, and, and what I wasn't sort of as, um, I guess, self-aware of is in that in that sort of framework i mean your interests aren't necessarily the same as 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 a venture capitalist i mean it doesn't mean they can't be and they and there's lots that are really good and and i think sort of you know they run a, a different playbook let's say than um than, than uh, some se segment of the market but essentially you know, if they're placing bets, you know, on, on companies, they're, you know, one out of 10, two out of 10, if they're lucky, are going to be successful. And so that perspective forces you in a much higher risk, higher risk uh, profile. And so what, what ends up happening, because they want to push growth, they want to give you more money, which there's no way that doesn't translate to more interest of your company and ultimately less control. And so I think, for me, it wasn't so much as I was wary of investors uh, and you know their participation on our board and things like that. It's just that that we would have as much alignment as possible. And so when it came to making those decisions on sort of risk and timing of risk, that that there was good alignment there. And and, and that way, your strategy and what you focus on was um, it was more helpful to what you wanted to achieve as an entrepreneur. So like when I'm talking to an entrepreneur, if I'm an angel investor and I'm looking to make an investment, I'm really trying to understand like what, what it is they want to achieve with this business and, you know, personally see like what kind of quality of life do they expect to have after five to seven years? Uh, you know, are they trying to, you know, be the next Twitter and there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to understand 
you know, the temperament of the individual that I'm getting. And I think it's just, and the same should go back to the investors. And, and it's, it's tough because, you know, you're trying to raise money at some point. You're like, Hey, you know, every dollar is green. I don't care where it comes from, but it, it ultimately makes a big difference. And I, and I was very lucky in that way because with legal anywhere, the investors that I had uh, from Portland, um, you know, Tom Hulse uh, being one of them was a sort of a long standing entrepreneur um, that most people have sort of uh, know of. And, and he had done a lot for and he was just sort of that type of a person that, that taught me and wanted that alignment. He didn't create a lot of differences in share classes and things that you can, investors can do to manipulate outcomes that, that, that have you misaligned when that event may reveal itself. So like an exit, for example. So, so that, that was, I think that's something, you know, um, first time entrepreneurs especially need to be cognizant of. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a good, really good point. Um, well, right now, as I mentioned earlier, you uh, serve as an advisor to other startup founders to help uh, develop their leadership potential. Um, share with us a little bit about how you select, um, again, your time and energy in, in what kind of process you use to identify the teams that you choose to work with. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. Um, so, I guess, um, you know, I don't want, I mean, I'll try, I'm not, you know, achieve what I'm doing right now is one of the reasons why I sort of started that effort was I, I'd got a lot of help along the way, you know, sort of, um, you know, pro gratis. I mean, no, I, I, that, you know, from other people that have been successful and, and had kind of gone through this path and consulting. And I think it's an entrepreneurial code that you give back. And, and, and one of the things that I was, um, finding is that I kept sort of communicating the same things when I was asked, you know, questions by entrepreneurs at different conferences or whatever. So I said, okay, I got to create a framework around this to where it's a little bit more scalable for me in my time too, and sort of try to create, um, uh, you know, a structure where you can kind of, we can both self identify that this is a good fit. And so my entrepreneurjourney.com blog is really about just talking about a lot of those sort of experiences. I think that, around the kind of questions I get asked achieve one what I really went back to uh, after 25 years of doing this and thinking well why did my companies work out I mean I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room um, you know I'm, I've obviously worked hard like any entrepreneur will do I mean and so uh, what I kept kind of coming back to was I feel like I developed myself um, whether this was sort of ostensibly or not is just a leader and I understood what it took to be a leader and and and, and then I started when I started breaking that down I realized that that's you know that there's actually I want to say a bit of a formula but there's things you need to do consistently to ensure that your team is enrolled to attract the right people because attracting the right people to your business when, and when they have lots of options in this day and age uh, can make the difference right and so and that all comes back to that those people evaluating you and your team and your leadership team. And once you get to that point is, are, is this person going to take care of my interest? Right. And are they, and are they going to help me be successful in the way I want to be successful? And, and I think entrepreneurs, I, I certainly looked past that initially because in my first company, because I just thought lead by example, work hard, get good results, that kind of a thing. And it's actually um, has to be a little bit, a lot more deliberate. And I, and I feel like in Mazama, by the time I'd gotten there to start that company, I, I it made it a lot more deliberate. And, um, and so that's what I look to help sort of people with achieve one out in terms of, you know, lining and selecting those entrepreneurs. A lot of it just sort of depends on where they're at in their life cycle. I mean, if they are kicking around an idea and it's just, I'm not really yet jumping off and committing to this both feet in, you know, that's a little early for me because um, I want to I want to make sure that they're kind of in and ready to go and all in. In some cases, already put money into it, usually family and friends round. Uh, you know, it's sort of that they've gone they've gone past the point of no return, if you will, <laughs> uh, and, and are willing to let it play out because then I then I think that's when they're really most in tune with not just sort of, Hey, is this something I might do? What can I learn from, 
you know, another entrepreneur, which is great. I'm happy to impart that, but it's but from a consulting standpoint, taking time and really digging in. It's um, I want to see that. I want to see him be at that stage. That, that makes a lot of sense. Well, my last question to you, as you think back over your career, um, if, and for advice for our students that are graduating and, and may want to uh, follow a similar career path as your own, um, any kind of advice or best practices, recommendations you can offer them in terms of, of um, you know, becoming a, a successful startup founder? Yeah, no. Um, well, there's kind of two things I would, um, that just come to mind uh, when you when you say this one, one when you ask the question one is um <clears throat> as i've listened as i've heard and i've seen ideas pitch and i've done a little bit you know obviously consulting and investing myself i i feel like uh i you know stating the obvious an entrepreneur will have the passion around whatever problem they're solving you know and 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 usually that should be uh, fairly obvious but and if you're not passionate about it and you're just doing it to make money i mean it's likely not going to work. And, and by the way, I sort of had one of those startups that failed like that. I was, you know, after I'd done legal anywhere, I kind of was like, Oh, okay. I took some time off, uh, got, got bored pretty fast and said, Oh, well, why don't I just start something else around this sort of collaborative technology area. And, and when it really kind of came down to a year later, you know, sort of recession hit 2001 two, I really wasn't that pa passionate about or committed to it. And I, and I just kind of, took that experience and that failure and said, well, I'm never doing anything that <clears throat> I don't believe is what I should be doing. And money aside, you know, that will come if I'm, you know, committed to solving the problem. And so that, that was, a, that was something I definitely look for, not just people trying to, you know, make it fast, you know, make that buck and, you know, doing it for that reason. And, um, and the other thing I, I would encourage people to do is like they, when they get an idea and they think it's a good idea, they start kind of putting it forward, like, Oh, see why this would work and all these reasons why I'd be successful. And I kind of do the opposite. Like I don't get emotional about anything until I find all the reasons why it won't be successful. Like, and then I, and if I'm still at the end of that cycle, how long that takes if I, at that point, I'm still like, well, no, this okay, we've answered all the reasons why this won't work. And we feel like we have, you know, reasonable, you know, um, you know, ways to approach those objections, then, then this is something I should do. So I sort of temper my enthusiasm. And I think, cause sometimes I feel like, you know, investors don't care. I mean, they, they're, they're not looking at you and they don't have the same sort of, you know, passion commit. They want that. But at the end of the day, they're looking through that lens of economics and markets and competition and, what's my return on investment? What are your assumptions behind business? So they don't care. I mean, they, they want that. They want, they want that sort of level of scrutiny. And so, you know, that's one piece of advice. Um, I think the other thing is, uh, you know, when you are young, I mean, you have energy, obviously, as you get older too, but when you're younger, I mean, you got all this energy and you've got different, you know, you don't have as many competing interests necessarily like family time and kids. And again, you should be a little bit, you learn things to so be better at that point, but it's sort of the time to really go for it. And, you know, and you can choose how to spend your time um, in your twenties, how you want. Everybody has that choice. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's when you have the most energy. And so uh, for me, that's where I was putting a lot of my efforts and, you know, obviously outdoors, all the things I still love. I mean, I'm not saying at all costs, I was never at a, at all cost all the time type of person i wanted a some level of balance but um i, I you know it's 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 a good time in your life to to really go for it and learn and i, I wouldn't be discouraged by the fact that you haven't had 15 years experience of seeing things i mean uh there's lots of people who've been working 15 years that are just that just sort of you know kind of do one thing or whatever so um, that would be my advice. Yeah, excellent advice. Thank you so much. Peter Ozelin is the principal of Achieve One. Thank you for joining us today, Peter. Yeah, happy to be here. And, it, and maybe we'll do this in person sometime at, uh, in, there in Eugene again. That'd be, love it. Love you having part, part yeah, come over here. Absolutely. Thank you.